Interested in more cinema of meaning? Each month we have an entire bonus episode available exclusively on our creator-owned streaming service, Nebula. So far we've talked about Sam Mendes' 1917, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, and Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece, 2001 A Space Odyssey. In addition to those and any future bonus exclusive episodes, you'll also get access to our regular episodes ad-free and a week early when you listen on Nebula. The best way to get Nebula is with the Curiosity Stream bundle. You can learn more about that in the description below or go to curiositystream.com slash cinema of meaning. You can even plug the Nebula feed into a normal podcast player and listen wherever you like. Sign up today to get more cinema of meaning and access to all the other great content on Nebula. This episode is sponsored by Mubi. Go to mubi.com slash cinema of meaning for your extended 30 day free trial. Welcome to Cinema of Meaning, the podcast that seeks to explore the depths of what cinema has to offer. My name is Tom, you may know me as the creator of Like Stories of Old. I'm joined by fellow video essayist Thomas Flight, and today we're doing something a little bit different. Instead of discussing one movie, we're going to talk about a collection of unconventional ones. Many of which you have probably never heard of, but we believe are absolutely worth checking out. We'll be focusing on documentaries and non-fiction titles, and explore the strange ways in which this format has been used to create meaningful cinema. Thomas, you recently made a video about experimental documentaries and the kind of movies that we're going to discuss today. What makes you so interested in this kind of filmmaking? I'm interested in talking about it because it's a genre of filmmaking that I've really fallen in love with. Some of my favorite movies are these kinds of films. I think they've had kind of an disproportionate impact on me, and yet it's one that doesn't you know, a lot of people have kind of a low opinion of documentaries or think they're boring or their exposure to documentaries just hasn't been, you know, is to a very conventional form of documentary. There's a lot of great films out there that not only like have fascinating things to say about the world and often have stories that are just as exciting and interesting as like conventional cinema, but also I think have a lot to teach us about how cinema works and how you can convey stories without, you know, just dialogue and people having conversations traditionally. Mm -hmm. So yeah, any chance I get to like promote these kind of movies and, <laughs> and try to convince more people to watch them is, yeah. is great. Yeah, that's also why we're kind of bundling a few of them together right now, because we could make episodes, I think, on many of individual movies that we're going to discuss. But yeah, when you have, there's a lot of them that just don't have any much popular appeal or yeah. People wouldn't know what you're even talking about if you're just if they're just seeing the name of the movie pop up in an episode. So hopefully we're trying to draw in a bit of a wider audience in this way and hopefully get them excited to check out some of these videos or to check out some of these movies. Yeah, I was just going to say with that in mind, we're going to try to one of the things is we will keep these spoiler free. So unlike normal episodes, for the most part, we won't be talking about spoilers in these mm -hmm. even though a lot of these movies aren't exactly the kind of movie that like could can even really have a spoiler but where there are mm, yep. spoilers to be had we'll, we'll avoid those um so don't worry about listening to this if you haven't seen what we're going to talk about yep that's uh, exactly what i was going to say <laughs> well <laughs> steal your thunder <laughs> yeah <laughs> Okay, so we've made a few very loose categorizations in which we're going to talk about some movies. We're also going to list all of the movies we talk about in the description. So if there's anyone that sparks your interest, be sure to check it out there and um, I'm sure you'll find it somewhere. So we're, we're going to talk about three separate categories. The first has been described as the cinema verité by the French and it's kind of a more general search for truth that began pretty much as soon as filmmaking became a real thing. But I think especially in the 60s, you had the, the rise of the cinema verite movement, which was basically the act of becoming more self-conscious about filmmaking in the sense that when you're trying to depict a certain reality or you're trying to convey a certain truth, 
you have to pay attention to the process in which you do so. You have to pay attention to the impact of the camera on the subject. You have to pay attention to how the certain camera angles or the frame presents a certain reality and also leaves certain things out of it. And yeah, there's just the cinema verite is basically an attention towards the way a movie inherently manipulates reality, I think. Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting to note because I think a lot of people's introduction to the term cinema verite is when it's used as kind of a stylistic point, sometimes even in mm. reference to like narrative. And that usually gets conflated with like naturalism, where it's just like very observational and like, but in documentary, the roots of cinema verite are, like you said, more concerned with being kind of aware of how the mm. process is, is affecting things. Generally, it leads to sort of a, a naturalistic observational style, but it doesn't in inherently necessarily mm, yeah. mean that. So I'll also mention that like we're categorizing these things, but some of the films we'll talk about may not fit perfectly into these categories or might seem to like have multiple of them. And that's kind of the nature of these types of films is that in their unconventionality, they often like don't fit neatly yeah. into one form or another, but we're going to do our best to, yeah. to kind of break those down. Yeah, some examples here would be uh, Chronicle of a Summer is a very, at least within the Cinema Verité movement, a very yeah. popular one, which is, as the title suggests, it's basically this slice of life portrayal of, I think it was Paris. Yeah, life, people in... in life in, yeah. Life in Paris, yeah. And oh, I don't remember exactly, but was that the movie where they, where one of the first questions that each, each of the subjects is asked is, how do you feel about being filmed right now or something like that? Yeah, I don't know if they do with every subject, but mm -hmm. I think they kind of start the movie off that way. And then it's brought up and examined in kind of each of the interviews. And then that documentary actually ends with like a section where they mm -hmm. round up all the people who they interviewed th throughout the documentary and then they show it to them at the end and then they film that. I, I mm -hmm. think this movie in particular, Chronicle of a Summer, is kind of a prototype for what would go on to become reality television. Like it was one of the first oh, impulses yeah. to like, oh, let's just film everyday people, uh, you know, kind of talking about their lives. And early reality TV, like the real world and MTV and stuff, has a lot more of this like sense of self-awareness and self-examination and like wondering how being in front of the camera is impacting the way that the, mm -hmm. the conversations are happening. So it's an interesting Chronicle of the Summer is is interesting in in that right itself and how like it explores those concepts. But it's also just a fascinating portrait of like a bunch of different people living in France in I think it was made in the 50s. Yeah, the 50s or 60s, maybe. Yeah, 50s or 60s. Yeah, especially over time, it's become like this interesting time capsule where what at the, at the time may seem like just ordinary boring life is now like a relic like this thing from the past that we no longer have like a direct connection with which is something that i generally like about older movies that they just accidentally capture something that may have been lost today or that looks very different now that's always interesting to watch it's kind of an anthropological document which even if that wasn't the intention at the time it becomes that over time it was filmed in 1961 interestingly mm. if somebody watches this one, or if this one sounds interesting to you, I highly recommend there's a television series called Seven Up that was filmed in Britain. There have been different versions that have since been filmed all around the world. The Seven Up series is in the UK is the only one that I've seen. But they start with a group of children. I forget what year they started filming it, but they start with a group of children. And it's very similar to Chronicle of a Summer in that they do interviews mm -hmm. with each of the children starting at age seven. And then every seven years, they returned and interviewed the same people. And it tracks with their lives in a very cinema verite format all the way up to the present day. The last one was made a, a couple years ago. And I think the participants are currently like in their 60s. And that has a very oh, well. similar like document yeah. of history and also how people's <laughs> lives progress in a way that I think is really is really fascinating. Yeah, that's cool. It, it's it's also bled over into just fictional filmmaking. Like you have television shows like The Office or Modern Family, each of yes. which seem to have this in which the camera is this 
kind of like a character, like there is a presence of the camera and you see characters responding differently because they know the camera is there. You know, you have like in the office, there's Jim who has his famous looks towards the camera and right. you have the modern family too. I think Phil is the one who does it a lot there. But yeah, there's also another movie that I, a more recent one that I thought was really interesting when it comes to discussing this kind of relation between the camera and the subject that's being filmed and that's uh, Free Solo. Not sure if you've seen it. I've seen it. It's been a while, a couple of years. Yeah, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's an unconventional movie. It's a pretty familiar, dramatic structure, but there is a specific point. So just in short, Free Solo is about a, I'm blanking on his name, but he's like a very famous free climber. So Alex Honnold. Okay. So he climbs these big, giant cliff faces without a rope, super dangerous. And for this documentary, they're filming him as he's doing one of the most dangerous climbs as the first one without a rope. I think that was the premise. Yeah. And so at one point, there's the discussion, like, if he's going to do this and he's going to climb this dangerous climb, like, how is he going to respond to having all these different camera crews around him? Like, is that going to affect his performance? Is it going to make him more nervous? Are they going to get in his way? Might they actually, like, that, that was a very real question that the camera crew might accidentally cause the death of this person if they like, yeah. interfere with his natural process. And so, yeah, it's a very great movie, not an unconventional one again, but yeah, it's, it's, I thought it was also a very interesting one. And yeah. you mentioned it briefly before, but I think it's from this movement that we also got the more naturalistic kind of documentaries, the more where the filmmakers become more like flies on the wall, they become more like objective observers and they try to really capture a sense of reality, like, or whether that's a slice of life or some, some other subject without interfering or with interfering as uh, little as possible. So they try yeah. to capture it as naturalistic as possible. Some examples of this are a recent one that I watched is the truffle hunters, which is about these Italian grumpy old men who go look for truffles in the forests. And then there's some portraits of like the whole industry behind it. It's kind of like the documentary version of Big, which we <laughs> <Yeah>. also discussed. <laughs> but what you see there is a very like distant camera, mostly like static. Like they, it's almost like they put the camera there and the actors or the actors, the, the sub subjects, they don't know that it's there. That's kind of the, yeah. the vibe of that whole thing. Another one that maybe possibly fits into this category is Leviathan, which is about this fishing vessel, that's, which is this really raw process like at some point it's literally like gopros strapped to the heads of these fishermen as they are just sailing out mostly at night in the rain and catching fish <laughs> how do you feel about these kind of documentaries the kind of that go for this more objective capturing of reality and how it stands in contrast with the initial kind of principles of the cinema verite and the search for this kind of truth basically yeah well i think there's part of it that i love this is kind of the mode of documentary that I prefer in a sense. Something that you'll notice is absent from most of what we're talking about. There's there's some exceptions, but most of what we're talking about doesn't have today in all of these categories, doesn't have like an interview where like somebody mm -hmm. sits down and they look at the camera and somebody off camera asks them questions and then they speak to the camera. And so there's a few exceptions to that. Like there's a little bit of that in Chronicle of Summer, but in Chronicle of Summer, one of the shifts they make is putting the people asking the questions on screen, which kind of contextualizes things a little bit differently. But instead there's, so there isn't this hand of manipulation from the, the creators of the documentary in terms of like mm -hmm. what they're trying to draw out of the subject in terms of the questions they're asking or what they're getting them to say. And then there's usually not like, voiceover that's like telling you what to think or feel about what you're seeing. And so you're left with what feels like a more objective perspective on the story, which is just like, here's the images of this event of this reality. And you are left as the viewer to kind of piece together the meaning out of that. But I think what is fascinating to me about these kinds of films, and I think what's good about experiencing them and watching them mm -hmm. is that it often reminds me how limited, like, you can have a spectrum of like bias and objectivity in documentary, but you can never truly like escape into an objective perspective. Like there's always the mm -hmm. Leviathan, I think is a great example where like the way that is shot in one sense, it's very objective. It's just like 
pure images and sounds of the thing itself. But in another sense, it's extremely subjective in that the shots that are being chosen, the way it's edited, the sound design, all of it is built to kind of craft this impression of like a monstrous beast, like, you know, mm -hmm. scraping across the ocean, like gobbling up everything in its path and just leaving like blood and fish gore in its wake. And so like it builds this image that, you know, is crafted by the filmmakers in a very like particular mm -hmm. way. I wouldn't even say that's an inaccurate image, but you could go onto that boat have no voiceover, no document, you know, and create a very different kind of image w with just the cameras and the position and the music and the sound design or whatever. That's one of the big things mm -hmm. that fascinates me is just how much ability to kind of communicate meaning exists in just like where you put the camera and what you choose to show and what you choose to leave out and those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. I think my personal issue, and I think it's also like the most common critique of these kind of movies is that as you said, like they make an effort to not manipulate the reality that they're capturing. At least they're trying to get it as unspoiled as possible, unspoiled. But in that effort, you kind of, you, they also erase the manipulation that does happen. And you don't see as clearly like where the kind of manipulation is happening. Yeah. Like, yeah. for example, the movie The Truffle Hunters that I mentioned, there's some dynamics there, they, or they try to portray some of the dynamics between the kind of the guys on the ground, the, the old uh, Italian men who are uh, searching for the truffles, and then the buyers, and then they kind of go up the social ladder, so to say, to, uh, to the one who is most in power. And it's clear that they're trying to convey some kind of meaning or some kind of opinion about how these relations are structured where one is kind of exploiting the one below them and so forth yeah but what you see is when they film some conversations with like these the buyers who come to buy from the older men and the, the actual truffle hunters you somehow you still get the sense that they know they're being filmed like right the camera will be like pretty far away and there'll be no mention of it whatsoever it will be just standing there all the time like completely unobtrusive and yet you even when you don't speak the language because it's in italian you can still kind of see or sense that they're trying to present themselves in a way that's gonna look favorable to them when they're gonna watch it back later yeah and that i think is the big issue with trying to convey natural human behavior without them affecting that behavior because they know they're being filmed yeah the obvious solution to this would be maybe to have like secret cameras but that <laughs> right. crosses also some ethical <laughs> lines yeah. another interesting thing that you can do is is just not film human beings at all but you can there's like some naturalistic movies like these that are about animals we both watched kunda last week there's another example. I haven't watched it myself, but I saw the trailer and it looks kind of familiar to Gunda, but it's uh, Cow by uh, Andrea Arnold, Arnold yeah. which is this documentary about the life of the life of a cow, or I think a dairy cow. Gunda is also, it's a portrait of some pigs on a farm and some chickens and a cow, I believe. Very like heightened in the sense it's black and white. It's beautiful cinematography. Of course, the cool thing about animals is that they don't, have that understanding of the presence right. of the camera so they will yeah. kind of act naturally they won't at least like pretend to behave in some kind of way because <laughs> right, they know right. they're being filmed <laughs> yeah so that's i think one subject where you can claim a more or where you can have that claim to actual reality but the thing there is that they, in these examples at least they're both have some I wouldn't say activistic, but there is some angle there that because they are farm animals, there's the obvious uh, associations with what does farm life mean to the animal. And in that sense, it does, the context does kind of matter. Like where do you, not so much how do you film it, but more so the surrounding subjects, like what kind of farmer would allow their animals to be filmed. Like obviously that's one who feels confident enough that they're not going to run into some horrible animal cruelty situation yeah so yeah that's i think that's basically my issue with that it, it can kind of like it can portray a certain image but it also can leave away a lot of contextual elements that might also matter a lot here yeah what i would say about these kinds of films is that 
It's great to watch them. I don't think there's anything wrong with those attempts. We just, as viewers, mm. always have to keep in mind the fact that no documentary or film is escaping the create like the perspective of the people who are creating it. And so we always have to keep that in mind, even though some styles might lend themselves to feeling more objective. We can feel like it's a very objective portrayal. There's always some level on which, you know, we are seeing literally through the eyes of the people who are creating the piece or the film or, or whatever. Some of these movies, we didn't mention it, but there are some documentaries in kind of the experimental space that are interested in like exploring that question itself. Like Orson Welles' F for Fake is a great example of that, where as a documentary, most of it is spent just like exploring the idea of how audiences can be manipulated by editing and storytelling and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. That one is a, is a great one. It's very convoluted and like all over the place but feels like the original video essay yes it, it's very essayistic it also reminds me a lot of like bo burnham's inside in how it mm. like kind of explores itself and orson welles is kind of constantly questioning his own like role in the process of kind of creating and manipulating the story for the audience so the these questions go Media, I think there's a, a modern resurgence of kind of self-reflexivity and self-awareness like in mm. a lot of popular media right now. But it's cool to see that like a lot of these questions <laughs> go very far back into into film history. Yeah. Before we move on entirely, though, I wanted to say I thought Gunda was great. I loved it a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, it has its it has its perspective and the the story is trying to tell, but it does so very effectively with these like really simple, these really simple shots. The, the mm -hmm. cinematography is beautiful and it does kind of manage to capture the mother pig as kind of a character, which is really fun. Like there's a little bit of a story to it. It's also sad, but. So I'm curious, like what does a movie like that like enlighten for you? Does it, does it show you or give you some insight at the end of it that was new or particularly impactful in some way or another that movie specifically most of what it did was kind of transport me back to my childhood i grew up on my family had a little farm it wasn't commercial and it wasn't the size of the one that's depicted in that film but we had a few goats and a few chickens running around and so it was like unlocking memories that i have of having chickens running around and being around yeah. animals and kind of what you're confronted with like being on a farm the sort of beauty of it but also mm -hmm. the like harsher reality of I, I love the sound design of that one yes it's, it's one of those movies you can put it on before you go to sleep and then just have the ambient noise of it just transport you to yeah a more beautiful world <laughs> i also love how like the perspective of the camera never goes above the eye level of the animals like you mm. always stay there's a scene where a tractor comes in and like the tractor is kind of like you don't see like the whole tractor. You just see like the big wheels, like from the scale that you would see them if you were like a little animal, like running around the farm, you just see this like huge piece of machinery. So I like how it, it gets you into the mm -hmm. perspective of the animals, which is very cool. The biggest thing is just like the amount of emotion that you see conveyed in the mother pig, who is kind of the, the mm -hmm. central character is pretty revealing. Like there is, it's rare that you get to spend that much time, especially with these kind of animals that we've contextualized as like, oh, they're farm animals or we eat them or whatever. Mm -hmm. We are very used to like dogs or cats or whatever being animals that have these like seem to convey emotions. But when you get these long shots of just like the animal like looking around or I don't know, I don't want to spoil it either, but uh, mm -hmm. it gives you the time and space to actually like spend enough time with the pigs to like kind mm -hmm. of appreciate the emotion yeah it definitely develops some kind of empathy with the animals yes yeah but there's at least for me like i pretty much could not not connect it to like animal rights issues and knowing how we generally treat animals yeah i think this is kind of the a different road towards some kind of animal rights message than let's say in something like earthlings or some other documentary that really kind of goes undercover into these places where anim animals are treated horribly and we really see the suffering and you really get these harrowing images and 
just documentaries that you really don't want to watch. Yeah. And this kind of shows the other side of it. It shows like, what if these animals were allowed to have welfare, to have a beautiful space, to be with their like family members, sort of. Yeah. What kind of emotions develop there and what kind of life and freedom and personalities develop from these creatures that we normally, on average at least, don't treat as well as portrayed in this movie. So yeah. it kind of, it shows, instead of the suffering, it shows like the potential when these animals are not in suffering, which in the end kind of leads to the same message, I think, about maybe we should treat these animals better. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's a part of me that's always like, wondering a little bit like how much does this really convey like how much can you really communicate with just these images like i think especially right. it's not just about gunda but now that we're talking about that one it's it's a good example i think a lot of people already know that for example pigs are pretty intelligent kind of on the same level as dogs and they know you probably shouldn't treat them as poorly as we sometimes do but there's a truth there that's already kind of present for, I think, for a lot of people. So when you have a movie like this that just describes basically and not really explains like anything behind it, like it, it can be tricky to measure the value of that. I think there's, yeah, it definitely can have a lot of value when you're like capturing spaces or certain realities that people aren't familiar with, but especially nowadays with the internet and every time something happens somewhere, there's a clip of it on the internet. So it feels like there's less of these hidden spaces or hidden realities nowadays than there might have been like 30 years yeah. ago or something. Do you think that has any consequences for the kind of value or purpose of these kind of documentaries? I mean, I think it does. On On one hand, it's very easy, I think, to to kind of cynically be like, well, if documentaries were going to change the world, they would have already because there's a documentary about mm -hmm. every issue out there. And that's true. a lot of people will watch a documentary like Gunda or, you know, something about how the oceans are being overfished or, you know, factory farming is horrible. And then they are like, yeah, that's terrible. And then they go right back to their, you know, their same habits. I mean, but I also know the ways in which my views, I think, have been impacted by documentaries or or ways in which certain documentaries have pushed me in certain areas to kind of have a different perspective or see the world from a, a different perspective. Yeah. So I think, you know, changing people's minds or influencing people is like a huge, difficult task. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's hard to point to any one documentary or type of documentary and be like, this is changing the world or that, you know, this will change anybody's mind who watches it. But I do think there's you know, from personal experience, I think there's a cumulative effect of viewing these things. And I would also say, I think it is kind of different from like, we become aware of these issues through the internet, but there's mm -hmm. something to me that's very different about like hearing about something and then like spending time with it in a movie where you really have to be there and immerse yourself in it for like two hours. And that's another thing I think we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we discuss some of these others that we'll start to get into. But with these kind of movies, especially when there's not narration, voiceover, interviews, and it's just kind of focusing on a single subject, there's almost, for me, a very like meditative quality to it where, mm. you know, I start watching a movie like this. It's very slow. It's just going to be like, you know, some piglets running around and very quickly, you know, there's an impulse your mind starts wandering or like you want to pick up i will want to like pick up my phone or or like watch something a little bit more like immediately viscerally entertaining but mm -hmm. there's an element of like pushing through that and just like allowing the yeah. film to kind of take you on the journey it's taking you on and i think that's a very valuable like can be a very valuable experience just in terms of like entering into a different kind of mindset or headspace about something mm-hmm yeah, I think you make a good point about the importance of actually spending real time with something instead of just reading an article or seeing a tweet or watching a short clip and having a movie that really connects you to the experience of whatever subject it is they are portraying. Yeah. 
This episode of Cinema of Meaning is supported by our sponsor, Mubi. Mubi is an online streaming cinema featuring hand-curated, exceptional films from all around the world. Every day, Mubi premieres a new hand-picked film. They have amazing classics, independent art house films, festival favorites, and new stuff that you've never heard of but will be excited to discover. Mubi isn't just a place I go to watch things, their curation makes it a place that I go to to discover new interesting things to watch. If you want to listen to more in-depth discussion of film as well, the Mubi podcast is now in its second season and that's available free to listen to wherever you get your podcasts. The new season is titled Only in Theaters and each episode is the story of an individual movie theater and the impact that it's had on film history or even history in general. For example, there's an episode that covers how Westgate, a little second-run theater in suburban Minnesota, turned Harold and Maude from a total flop into a beloved cult classic. And this season features guests like Peter Strickland and Alejandro Jodorowsky. Sign up for your extended free trial of Mubi when you go to Mubi.com slash Cinema of Meaning and check out Mubi's second season of its award-winning podcast wherever you get your podcasts. You also watched a, I haven't seen it yet, but you mentioned a movie about the clothing oh, industry. Yes. Yeah, this is actually a movie that what, it's called, it called Machines. Again? I'm kind of hesitant to talk about it because mm -hmm. I actually didn't even finish it. I, I want to go back and watch the rest of it at some point, but I haven't gone back. But it's very harrowing. It's it's just like a depiction of the working environment. It's from 2017. There's different different years. It depicts the working conditions of a textile factory in southern India. And it does so in kind mm -hmm. of like Leviathan. There are some interviews, some moments where the workers actually speak to the camera, but there's long sections that are kind of similar to Leviathan where it depicts the environment in this very like visceral, immediate way. And mm -hmm. even though I didn't finish it, it almost immediately had an impact on like I've been aware of the issues with the garment industry and clothing and like fast fashion and some of these things, mm -hmm. but I hadn't seen such a visceral depiction of like what that looks like even though i'd read about it in articles and like seen stuff online and that was almost immediately like oh galvanized me into feeling like this is more important than i had previously considered so that's when i want to i yeah. want to finish when i have some time and can be in the right heads i mean mm -hmm. that's something i'll say about a lot of what we're talking about is I love these kind of movies and these kind of documentaries, but I can't watch them all the time nonstop because mm -hmm. a lot of them deal with very heavy things and they're not fiction. So there's an added weight of, you know, this is part of the world that we're living in. And sometimes mm -hmm. that can be yep. very like heavy headspace to be in. And so I couldn't watch only documentaries about serious issues that are happening in the world all the time i think it would be too overwhelming yep i agree shall we move on to another yes. category then yeah. because in sort of in response i think to the cinema verite and the kind of the issues with trying to capture a objective truth using the means of cinema there's also been a bit of a counter movement almost or a at least a different philosophy about how to go about doing so there's not really a name for it i think werner herzog is probably most famous for coining the term ecstatic or poetic truth and basically that tries or that means that these documentaries do not necessarily try to capture an objective factual truth but rather a more poetic or subjective one that's more concerned with like invoking a feeling or a vibe and it's trying to create more of an atmosphere or like tell its story more like a myth and to really get at something more obviously takes much more fabrication and stylization than aspirations towards pure objectivity in the other movies we just discussed they just try to convey something truthful about the kind of subjective human experience. I mentioned Werner Herzog. He has some documentaries that would obviously fit into this category. I think his most experimental ones are Fada Morgana and Lessons of Darkness. Yeah. You've seen both, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's been a while since I've seen Fada Morgana, although that mm, movie has yeah. a clip that 
I, that is permanently lodged in my brain of the guy playing the drums and the lady playing the piano. Something about it, I don't know, for some reason. it's stuck, And there's no context for it whatsoever in the film, but it's lodged <laughs> in my brain forever. But to me, Lessons of Darkness yeah. is the real like standout one there where... You want to give a quick summary of what it's yeah. about or what kind of film? It centers on here? primarily the Kuwait, I guess, oil crisis is what you would call it. There was oil fires. It uses footage from that and the attempt to like put out the fires and reseal these like oil wells, essentially that are spewing mm -hmm. oil into the air. You get yeah. no actual context for like the event, the history of it, what's happening Herzog instead kind of contextualizes it almost as he uses the image, which are very stark and like huge billowing clouds of black smoke that are like blocking mm -hmm. out the sun and like oil covering the very hellish yeah, landscape, like fire spewing into the sky. Mm -hmm. And he uses those images and then contextualizes it kind of as an apocalypse using like some hmm. quotations from like the book of revelation and some like just pure fabrication i think mm -hmm. yeah apparently there's a quote at the opening of the movie but in some interview he said like oh i made <laughs> yeah, it up yeah like, he, he just thought it sounded interesting yeah. <laughs> and then he there's, does that a lot. there's some there's like an interview i think with one woman and her child who are like refugees but again like you don't really get context within the film for how that fits mm -hmm. into the story itself. It's more just this like cumulative portrait of darkness, I guess, or like, you know, mm -hmm. sort of, I don't know what you would call it, but some kind of a sense of evil or destruction or something, the darker nature of humanity. Yeah, I think it's so interesting how he does that. He does it in his lesser unconventional movies as well or the documentaries that feel more yes. straightforward i remember bells from the deep which was this kind of exploration of russian religion and the sort of smaller religious communities that you can find in russia and he, he at one point shows this ritual there's a, apparently a lake that's frozen over and it's, it's super deep and apparently there's this ritual where people like they will lay on their belly on the ice and they try to look through it and to see some kind of hidden city i think it was and then later i learned like that's herzog made that whole thing up like there's no such thing that people <laughs> do there <laughs> and it's funny and so on the one hand you can argue like oh he's manipulating like giving you false facts yeah. essentially like he shows you something about some people or someone which isn't true but he does it at least in his own conviction, like he does it to enhance some kind of, like a little lie to enhance a deeper truth. Yeah. He even does it in the documentary Little Dieter Needs to Fly, which is about this pilot who crashed in Vietnam during the Vietnam War, and he was imprisoned there and ultimately escaped. And he speaks with this real person and they kind of go on the, they kind of retrace their journey back together. At one point, Herzog is at his house and he shows him Dieter, that's his name. He opens the door, but he always does it like multiple times. Like he opened the door, then close it again, then open it again, then close it again. Apparently because he's because he's been in, imprisoned, like he's afraid of cages, like he needs to know that he get, can yeah. get out. And apparently that's something that also Herzog directed him to do. Like it's oh, not something that he did yeah. <laughs> naturally. <laughs> right. like, and it's all these little things like, and apparently he went along with it. So I'm guessing he was fine, yeah. but with Herzog portraying something about him that wasn't technically true, but yeah, I guess it's his way of trying to invoke a certain emotion or some kind of feeling that wouldn't otherwise be communicated yeah. as clearly. I'm personally a big fan of this kind of filmmaking. I think I find it personally more moving than these more objective like sterile fly on the wall kind of filmmakers mm -hmm. or filmmaking i always love the way hurt success like we as filmmakers then we shouldn't be flies on the wall we should be hornets <laughs> that sting yeah i think that yeah. was kind of i also love models. it and there's not i mean it's not uncontroversial i think he kind of gets an unnecessarily bad rap sometimes especially when you think about the kinds of manipulation that exist in documentaries all the time that people just kind of accept like 
dramatizations in sometimes crime documentaries. And to me, that's a very, you know, almost like ethically gray area if you're trying to convey the truth of like mm. having actors recreating this moment. I think like the sketchy part of it is important as the viewer, I think, to maybe be aware of those elements and how somebody is using them in their filmmaking. And if you're trying to make a specific point factually and you do that, you know, it can it can undercut your argument. But most of the time, I don't think yeah. Herzog isn't like, here's why we need to vote for this policy and here's the facts why, but he's bending the facts. It's more like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm trying to create a, a portrait of the feeling of this thing and then he he does mm -hmm. that. And in my mind, it kind of relates to like, if we think about myth in society as being a tool that people have used to like understand their experience of the world, he's kind of like, flipping that back around and then like applying myth back to these images of the the natural world yeah. to actually convey the feeling of what it's like to be there and not just the facts of the situation which i think you know mm -hmm. is sometimes when you just sit back and you don't engage or you don't like mythologize what you're talking about you you can show it to the audience but you're not conveying to the audience like what that experience is actually like mm -hmm. yeah i think herzog calls it the accountant truth yes. <laughs> it's like it's like you can have a phone book with every number of every or the name of every individual that lives somewhere and that but that wouldn't tell you anything about their lives yeah. and that wouldn't like relate you to them particularly i always like to quote herzog <laughs> because each <laughs> just such funny yes. opinions about filmmaking such a such an eccentric yeah. man i hope he never stops there's making few movies. filmmakers who are quite as like revolutionary yeah. or i think just like anti-establishment yeah. as as herzog which is great yeah but to add a critical note like as you said when the issue with where and how to manipulate truth to get a in your opinion, like bigger truth, it is kind of dependent yeah. on the judgment of one person, in this case Herzog, but you know, every other documentary crew kind of faces the same challenge. But yeah, I think it's it, the difference is like where it crosses a line into like ethical grayness is just kind of is about like the purpose of what you're trying to do. Like Herzog is not a very activistic no. kind of filmmaker. He's not really trying to move society in a certain direction at least not explicitly he's more about articulating who we are and maybe reflecting some part of ourselves that will hopefully enrich our soul and if that leads to something good then that's fine but he's not he doesn't set out to capture this factual truth because it's important for the world to see this particular yeah. thing in which case you can get away with it a little bit more i think it does take some conscious awareness of the on the part of the filmmaker and i think herzog has a good enough feeling for what can be real and what does has to be yeah. left alone for example there's that scene in grizzly man about the bear sort of activist who eventually got killed by bears in some reserve there was uh, this guy who was filming himself a lot with the bears and eventually he got attacked and eaten while the camera was still rolling. But uh, the cap was on, so there was no visual, but there was audio of him being killed. And the movie does show Herzog himself listening to that tape, but he specifically talks about in the movie itself about the importance of not showing it or not having anyone else besides him and the authorities that were involved in processing the death, obviously. He didn't want anyone to hear it. Like for him, that crossed a ethical line. Yeah. And there's another example that I want to mention. I'm forgetting the name of that documentary. I think it was The White Balloon or something like that. Something with a balloon. There was some guy who was making this balloon tour through the jungle. And at some point he stumbled or Herzog stumbled upon these local people who had this waterfall that they really... That was kind of sacred to them. And there was a space behind the waterfall that was, it was like this cavern type of space that was like a sacred space to them. No one knew what was behind it. And so that was kind of their source for their local myths and religion. 
And at one point, someone, I think Herzog, not Herzog himself, but some cameraman, they tried to go behind the waterfall to film what was behind it, but he decided not to include it in the movie and also not show it to the local people because he recognized the importance of that place staying like this mythical mystery and not yeah you know in that sense it was actually the the ethically right thing to not show the factual truth but instead let people keep their like the thing they value so much yeah. in their lives and so there is a i think there's always a nice i think he has an underrated sensitivity in that sense also in what to show what not to show where to add layers of drama and where to take away like things that could be considered just shock value or that would be to the detriment of some people or some individuals who would be damaged by seeing whatever it is that he puts yeah. in his movie. And um, yeah, it, it just raises some interesting questions about what to film, what not to film, how to relate yourself to what you're filming and also recognizing the level of responsibility that you have in creating certain experiences that are either meaningful or maybe yeah. harmful to some. This whole question people. also too is like, there is certainly ethics involved, but almost to me, it's less of an, the ethical part of it is less of a process question and more of like a um, labeling issue, at least when you come to like, whether or not you're accurately conveying the truth, because <clears throat> we make fiction films all the time that are based on truth or, or purport to be based on reality in some way or comment on reality mm -hmm. and we manipulate it all to pieces and we accept that as like just a normal part of you know we might get upset if it's like particularly egregiously manipulative but we accept a huge amount of just like manipulation of the facts and how things happened and you know just pure invention of dialogue and all of these things um, but then as soon as somebody's making a documentary you know if there's a little bit of manipulation it's like oh, oh don't do that and I think that's almost more of a problem with how we like label things into these strictly nonfiction fiction categories, documentary mm -hmm. narrative categories that like we need a little bit of gray space in between there. You know, you can take what is quote unquote a documentary because there's not actors really. It's just like you're just taking footage from reality, but then you're still crafting a narrative out of that or you have the intention creating a story with that and that's different from you know the intent of like i want to show you the audience the facts about the world visually and objectively and we just don't we don't mm -hmm. you know that's not really the filmmaker's fault so much as it is just like society doesn't have a complex nuanced enough way of like delineating between these different kinds of films yeah so what, what other movies do you think were effective at conveying this kind of more poetic truth? Besides Herzog, Dog, there's a few I'll mention. I think it's kind of hard to, like, this is one of the looser categories. But mm -hmm. Theo Anthony yep. is a documentarian whose work I'm really interested in right now. His work is almost more essayistic. He uses a lot of video essay. But what I like about it is he often touches on a variety of subjects to create a whole out of a bunch of smaller parts. He's done two mm -hmm. feature documentaries, one called Rat Film, which is about rats in Baltimore. The other is called All Light Everywhere, which is about police body cameras and surveillance mm -hmm. also kind of centers around Baltimore, Maryland. And he doesn't manipulate truth quite in the same way that Herzog does, but there's a poetic element to kind of how he's putting everything together. And there's very much this sense to me that like yeah. the whole is greater than the sum of its individual parts. Like he's trying to tell, convey a larger truth by, you know, assembling mm, a bunch yeah. of tiny pieces. I think that's, yeah. I don't know. I, I very much enjoy that, that style. Yeah. Just to emphasize, I don't think that this category is not necessarily a poetic truth. It's not necessarily about manipulation right. as much as it's about, it can also be just yes. stylization or a more explicit yeah. stylization. I think Voyage of Time by Terrence Malick would also fit into this category loosely. Like it's this big sprawling portrayal of the beginning of time, moving into like the forming of planets and the creation of life and then a brief bit like with human beings 
before again moving even further like the, into the far future and the potential like end of times what does that look like which i thought was also really interesting because it does have some narration but it's not like explanatory yeah. it's more like more someone wondering about the nature of the universe and asking questions about it but not even like explicitly but more something like the, the questions that you more that you carry around like subconsciously yeah. more so the, that film is streaming on Mubi, by the way. Voyage of Time, it's, yes, um, yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, they have it, and they have an exclusive version that's only on their platform, but which is pretty cool. It's the Brad yes. Pitt narrated one, which I was fortunate enough to be able to have seen in cinema way back when it played in like one <laughs> theater in my country. So I was happy to be able to see that. But one I'm, again. I'm pretty sure Mubi is like the only way, definitely the only way you can get access to that version. And it might even be, at least in the U.S., the only mm -hmm. way you can access any version of it. It was really hard to find for a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah that's true. That out. Yeah. It's kind of like, for anybody who's mm -hmm. seen Tree of Life, you may, you may have already mentioned this, but it's kind of like an extended mm. version of the sort of creation sequence from that with some other stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I definitely take your point about the stylistic poetry of that. And I think that Theo Anthony g gets to that point where you definitely feel the difference between something like what... Theo Anthony is doing in All Light Everywhere or like Malik is doing, even though there's stylistically entirely different kinds of films, like mm -hmm. there's a distinct difference in approach between that and something like Free Solo, The Truffle Hunters, Gunda, you know, Chronicle of Summer, some of those other films that we talked about earlier. This category is particularly yeah. interesting to me. I'm kind of working on a project that sort of mm -hmm. kind of falls into that category that I'm not talking too much about yet. We'll see. But trying to feel mm. my way <laughs> through posted. what this kind of documentary <laughs> means. I also think like, yeah. in a sense, what we do isn't strictly documentary. It's a different medium. But sometimes the kinds mm -hmm. of videos that we're trying to make, I think sometimes fall into this category where we're taking footage and trying to pull something, at least your work. I've had this feeling watching some of your videos mm -hmm. where you're trying to get at something in a very poetic sense that is more than just the evaluation of the pieces that you're looking at. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that I, when I started the channel that I set out to do is to try and convey something about cinema using yes. its own techniques. Whereas at least I felt back then a lot of videos were just having the chill hop right. mu music or and explaining stuff like it was the kind of the vibe of the video itself was often so divorced from the subject matter of the movie it was discussing. But yeah, that's yeah. a bit of a side note. <laughs> I'd also say the Leviathan kind of yeah. fits into this category. We've talked about it in the sense of that it kind of depicts this raw reality from these fishermen. But for me, it also, at one point, it, it kind of feels like this, or it, it reminded me of Dante's Inferno to some extent, where you have this, it, it felt biblical, you have the, this boat that's on this stormy sea and it feels all it all feels kind of hellish and there was an otherworldly quality to it as well that gave it for me a more poetic yeah. vibe as well. But yeah. I agree. I, I think that movie is a great example of how far you can push style with just just with editing and like composition and like the choices you make in the camera. And picking the right time to film yeah. and i mean there's yeah. there's shots in that that are just like kind of i don't know just like grotesque and haunting they make like the very act of just like the the ship like wrapping up the chains that pull the nets in up into yep. this like feels like a monster like grrr, you know it's got this insane sound and it's <laughs> dripping water and it just feels like i don't know <laughs> maybe it's because i'm still playing elden ring right now which also has this kind of dark yeah. hellish world vibe that this movie pulled me into that direction but uh, yeah that's definitely more than just the reality of what went on on, yeah. on a boat like that that i felt well one more that. movie i think i'll, I'll mention in, in this category is Kristen johnson's camera person from 2016 which i really like and it is a, a documentary that's kind of assembled out of footage that she shot for a bunch of other documentaries. So she worked as a camera person for years and then got a bunch of mm -hmm. leftover footage and sections from other documentaries 
and assembled them into one giant documentary. And I think it kind of fits into this category in that like what that documentary is about is about her experience, I think, as a camera person. And you kind of get this sense of the person behind the camera through all of these things that she's seen and documented in the process. And there's sort of a poetic sense to that that comes through not just in how she shoots things, but also in how it's edited and what she chooses to or like what they choose to mm -hmm. leave in. And she kind of shows these moments or these things that she's shot that have shaped. It feels like that have shaped who she is, even though you never hear from her in the film. It's a very beautiful documentary as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I haven't seen it. <laughs> Sounds like it's, uh, it's a worth good one. checking out. It kind of has elements of maybe what we'll talk about next in that it touches on a lot of different areas and kind of paints this larger portrait of mm -hmm. the world. It's not entirely nonverbal in that there are some elements where like characters from the documentary speak, but it's not towards the end of like crafting this narrative. The narrative itself is, is conveyed nonverbally, I think, in the film. Yeah, as you said, that's what's going to be our next category. The more, the even more ambiguous, mostly these are completely nonverbal documentaries that at least on the surface are, do not really seem like they're trying to communicate a certain truth or anything in particular really, but they're really just about creating space for meaning to yeah. emerge. Some of the most famous examples of these would be Samsara and Baraka. I think both of those were made by the same filmmaker, Koyani Skatsky. Yeah. yeah. These are these really big, big documentaries. They have like footage from all over the world and they kind of edit it together, not in a way that creates this explicit feeling or this obvious message about something, but it's more like a... I don't know how we can me, these it? movies are movies that tell stories of the world on a huge macro scale. Like they have a perspective of a global perspective instead of like, here's a character. And I do think that it's subtle, but I, I do think there's like a little bit of a story to each one or kind of a difference in subject matter. Like Baraka mm -hmm. highlights a lot of religion and kind of religion's tension with like modern life. That's not explored explicitly, but you see all these images of like different religion Tradi religious traditions and practices around the world and then that's contrasted against like cities where there's this one shot in particular in that movie where it's like a monk slowly like walking through a city and the people are just like rushing around him on every side mm -hmm. that image just kind of like the larger narrative that that movie is getting at koyana scotzi mm -hmm. Is which the title is a uh, Hopi in the Hopi language, I think is how you say it. it, means life out of balance. And so, like, that story is about like the emergence of the industrial revolution and sort of the Anthropocene and how we're changing Earth itself and building cities and humanity in, in those cities. So, I'm sorry it's been a long time since I watched that one. I don't. No, that's actually the one that I've rewatched most recently, most recently of those. Yeah. Did you get any sense of like a narrative within that? Not particularly. I there's one of those movies that where I I don't remember ex, like as clearly the whole progression, but I do remember some very distinct scenes really well. Like there's one that just focuses on this office worker, or at least that's what it looks like. But he's some kind of art performer who then he grabs like this clay and he starts rubbing it on his face and he turns himself into this weird monster that keeps transforming and he he like rubs it off and then rubs yeah. it all on differently again and then he has like some kind of ink that he and feathers that he it was this really bizarre just performance which felt kind of out of place with all the other images that were mostly like oh here's a city here's some shots of the people that live there and now we're in some temple and these ladies are doing a religious dance or something like that and there's definitely some aspect there about just a balance between maybe the natural or at least like the part of us that's still connected to the natural world and some sort of natural harmony and the absurdity of some of our self-created yeah. spaces and uh, ways of being that kind of uh, 
become highlighted there. There's some of these shots with like supermarkets and it's, I think it's these time lapses from like you see the animals and then you see like slaughterhouses. It's not really graphic, but uh, you kind of see the, the, the farm to table yeah. process in this kind of time lapse way, which is pretty interesting as, yeah, we all know it, but it's, it's one of those things that you don't, again, don't really think about as yeah. explicitly until you're reminded of it again. But, but yeah, I, it's, I, I always find these kind of films more difficult to judge and value and because they seem so open-ended into or as to what people get out of it and what you're maybe supposed to get out of it. And maybe that's also like the false bias that we have that when you watch a movie, you're supposed to get something out of it or you're supposed to be given something instead of maybe project something of yourself onto it and maybe have your own active or bring your own like active awareness to it to create meaning that might not be yeah. there or something like that. But I'm not sure what your these movies to that. me are are like very special to me. I think what you just mentioned of there not being like this clear like here's the message, here's the thing to take away from it. I don't think they necessarily have that, you know, besides what is there for you to kind of read into it. I mean, I, there's like obviously like Koya Nascazi with its life out of balance thing kind of has a certain perspective of like life is in balanced and mm -hmm. there's, you know, modernity and industrialization and like some of those things maybe lead us in that direction. But mostly I think it's just putting into perspective the image of the world that I'm working on a video now about everything everywhere all at once. And in that video, I'm talking about the overview effect that astronauts experience where they go to space and they look down on Earth mm. and they see this like tiny blue ball and it's just bending by underneath them and they see it go underneath over and over again. And they talk about how like profound that experience can be on their perspective of like what life is on Earth and how we're all connected and how our individual choices impact other people and how we've transformed the surface of the earth because you can actually see it from space and all of these things and i don't obviously you know a two-hour movie is not as profound i'm sure as going to space but i think some of mm -hmm. these movies like simsara get at that in that they show you the this connection to this and how like your life in your tiny part of earth mm -hmm. is connected to this kind of universal experience around the yeah. globe a lot of us know that or are aware of that but mm -hmm. sitting in and kind of experiencing it within a two-hour space i think is a very different kind of thing where you get to see all of these different people mm -hmm. all of these different cultures all these different religions and like the entire support system that kind of holds it all in place within you know a, a single film i think it's a good way to maybe like gain a a, a new kind of insight into what life on earth looks like that i don't think like I can't think of another kind of experience that would allow for that. Yeah, it's harder to put into like yes. literature or yeah. something that to have that, especially when you're just using images, you can obviously convey so much with a single image. But when you have these different images from all over the world, then you obviously have this accumulative effect that's more than just the individual yeah. images uh, themselves. Like they, there's this meta meaning that's kind of emerges from it at least if you let it but yeah i, I agree that there's definitely something unique about watching movies like that they don't always have to go like on a or they don't always have to be about the global skill i also watched another movie that i actually got recommended through your video on the experimental documentaries which was sleep has our house which is basically the same concept it just shows you like uh, these different images without any narration, any explanation. But instead here, it's mostly, I think it's a single forest or just at least some, a more um, restrictive area. It kind of shows you these images of the forest and of some horses and later in the film, there's a storm and, but there's nothing much else to it. Like the opening shot is this really, really long shot of a just yeah. a waterfall <laughs> that i think is pretty much a way to like filter <laughs> right. the audience like if if that 
if you sit this through this one <laughs> take, then you you're ready for yeah. the rest of it. <laughs> but it kind of uses the same techniques, I think, to some extent, the nonverbal use of imagery without having a clear or explicit message to also tell a story. But I think it's a different kind of story than like a samsara or a baraka yeah. would do. It's more sleep has her house to me is more about a specific vibe or feeling. It captures a certain feeling that I've only mm -hmm. ever had, like literally being in the woods, kind of feeling like vulnerable in the context of, you know, nature and just a storm rolling in or something like that. And so it's fascinating to kind of spend the time with a movie that will kind of convey that experience or is able to capture that very specific, like odd kind of feeling. Hmm. And it's a very stylized one too. Like it's not just shots of nature, but it's these almost square or like old timey aspect ratio and very technically bad yeah. footage. Like it's very dark and very obscure. And it's more, I think, about the sound as well as then on, on in the image itself. There's always something like some element that, but that you might have like at night in a forest, like you're not sure what exactly you're seeing and there might be something lurking there, but you don't know what it is. And yeah, there, there's a there's an interesting way that movie shows the thing that it's showing you. It's not just, here's a forest and I we've captured it clearly and yeah, objectively. Capturing a very specific perspective of that forest or like I don't know. Even just, I think that movie does something which there's this long section towards the end where like it's very dark and you just kind of hear the wind and like, and there's these mm -hmm. long sections of darkness. And then every now and then you just like catch this kind of glimpse of, you know, the trees blowing in the wind or like different things happening. And it's like, normally that's something that nobody would do in a movie. It's just like, you can't have like three minutes of just like blank dark screen or whatever but doing that in this context like allows you to create this experience of like you're lost in the woods and you can't really see anything and you just mm -hmm. hear these creepy spooky sounds and you you don't and then you lightning strikes and you like catch a glimpse of the eerie like trees bending above you and uh it's quite evocative i think it also dips into that mm -hmm. kind of yeah. territory again that i was talking about with like gunda where it's it is almost a kind of meditation mm -hmm where you'll sit there if you watch it and you sit there you're gonna if you're the average person in in today's society i imagine pretty quickly you're gonna want to be like <laughs> you know oh there's something more exciting i could be watching or look at your phone or but you have to kind of like force mm -hmm. yourself to participate yeah. with the movie and see where that leads you and allow that to be part of the experience I definitely found that to be quite yes, a challenge. Yeah. There's definitely moments during that movie where, like, we're, we're talking very enthusiastically, <laughs> yeah. but the, the truth is, like, where, there were plenty of moments during that movie and some of the other ones we've talked about too, where I was like, okay, I've been staring at this for two <laughs> minutes now. I'm, yeah. Like, I get yeah. it. <laughs> Starting to get a bit yeah. bored, but yeah. So, I mean, I, like, I think that's a good thing to acknowledge because we're kind of recommending these things, yep. but I want to be upfront about the fact that like a, a movie, especially like sleep has her house or a lot of these movies, it's you, you kind mm -hmm. of have to engage with them in a different way. You can't, you, you can't just sit down and be like, yeah. I'm going to be entertained by this movie. You have to participate in viewing it. And I think if you do a lot of the time, you'll yep. get something out of it, but there's a certain level of discomfort to that, that I think is normal. And that's part of why, I think this is an interesting, these are interesting things to do because, you know, like meditating mm -hmm. or whatever, it can be uncomfortable to do, but I think there's something worthwhile in that, in that practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. They're obviously called unconventional for a reason. I think it's also because they might demand unconventional yes. viewership. Like they're not, it's not like, oh, I just got home from a long working day. Let me unwind with a yeah. movie for two hours and then. You're, you're not going to put on, I mean, I mean, you can put on like a movie like Sleep Has Our House or Leviathan, but I doubt you're going to be as entertained as you yeah. hoped you would. Yeah. Be. <laughs> it, yeah, it does take a bit of, I would almost say preparation, but yeah, it's, you, you need to get your mind like in the, in <laughs> yeah. the right yeah. headspace for, 
depending on which uh, movie exactly. It's not one you, uh, you know, you recommend at the family get together when you're trying to like decide on a movie to watch as (laughs) as a group. (laughs) Yeah. Do you have any other movies in this category that you? I mean, there's others that I've watched, but I think we've talked about the ones that are most compelling to me. I watched a few. James Benning is another documentarian who I'm aware of, but his are like really almost more like art pieces. Like it's it's pretty hard to sit down and engage with like long, you know, it's it's really meditative. It's just like long static Mm, shots of landscapes or something. There's not even a kind of crafting of an experience in the same way there is with Sleep Has Her House. It's just like here's, you know, a succession of images mm-hmm. of the natural environment or something and it builds up a sense of a yeah. of a place but but you re- like you really have to be <laughs> prepared to <laughs> to sit there it's, i think that the big downside of this kind of filmmaking is that it's so easy for it to feel really pointless yeah, and yeah. pretentious because it feels like you can and I, i'm sure some filmmakers have done it you can just point the camera right. at anything film for whatever amount of time and then present it as cinema and maybe if you're lucky you can get people to engage (laughs) with it but you know there's always a line like in the end if you're like allowing the audience to be more active in their fulfillment or like creation of meaning for your piece of work then you also have to take into account that a lot of people won't find any meaning and then in that sense for them your work then becomes kind of meaningless because if if there's not a strong like sending message then and the receiver doesn't see anything themselves then it can be a a, quite an empty experience in that sense and but that i guess depends on the subjectivity of the person but that's also what makes it beautiful you can really create these personal attachments to films like these that you know like no one else might enjoy or at least no one you know but you know that you will always have like that experience you treasure or for some yeah i think that's definitely worth noting is like what we've talked about today are movies from this category that we've enjoyed there's definitely movies from this Mm -hmm. style or category that i've watched that just didn't really do anything for me that i was kind of bored by or or i'm just like i don't get it you know and that's fine i think if you're gonna we're we're all used to the fact that movies are subjective normally where like you know you watch a movie mm-hmm. and some people are going to like it some people aren't but like there's certain kinds of movies that it's like even if you don't like it you could probably be pretty entertained by it most people anyway when you start moving i feel like mm-hmm. the further you get away from like conventionality the further you get into a space where like you're going to have movies that they become even more subjective i think in whether or not it's going to resonate with you and i think that's part of what you were saying where like if you watch the first thing on our list and you're just like, I don't get it, it, that might just be that movie and not the fact that like unconventional documentaries or whatever as a whole aren't for you. Mm-hmm. So I think it also becomes harder to talk about them because even with conventional movies, even if you feel like this didn't resonate with you or, or, or it did very much, you can to some extent put that subjectivity aside and also talk about the more objective qualities of a movie like you can talk about things like pacing or script or character work or plot holes and stuff like that with some sense of objectivity that may or not like enhance the subjective experience of it but with these movies that really kind of break away from all those objective discussions and sometimes even purposefully defy them like how do you it also becomes much more difficult to talk about them on that kind of objective level because what might be considered poor filmmaking for a conventional movie might be the very thing that enhances the quality of an unconventional one yeah do you maybe have like for people who have just listened to the podcast they want to start with some of these movies like do you recommend any particular one do you have so yeah this is obviously a big list i would say because of what we just talked about where it's more subjective if there's anything in particular that sounds interesting to people just dive in there and start there but Mm -hmm. if i had to give a specific recommendation out of this Mm -hmm. i personally think that everybody at some point should at least give samsara koyana scotsi or baraka a shot you don't have to watch all three of those but Mm -hmm. one of those i think they're really special movies to me personally, and I think there's something that probably everybody can get out of them. So 
Koya Nascazi is kind of one of the original ones. It's it's worth checking out, but Samsara and Baraka are, mm. are also really amazing. So yeah, that would be my recommendation. Check out one of those specifically, but but anything we talked about today, I think if it sounds interesting to you, is is a great place to start. Yeah, I was particularly surprised by uh, Leviathan because especially as I was watching it, I didn't like I thought well, some as some aspects were interesting, but I didn't think it would stick with me as much as it did. And I still find myself like thinking about it today, even though it's been now it's now been a while since I've seen it. But I think that's also a good movie that has elements of all the categories we discussed. So in that sense, it might be a good one to just have a basic reflection of some of the different types of filmmaking that we've discussed as the very uh, grittiness of the realistic filmmaking with the GoPros and really the, the the subjectivity of being on that ship but there's also the poetic quality to it with it feeling like this otherworldly place to, at, at times where you're kind of feeling that, like you're going down the river sticks on your way to hell. <laughs> I would mention there is some animal yes. cruelty in there so uh, if you're not okay with looking at fish being like treated by fishermen as they are then this might not be the the best place to start for you as for the last category it's also completely yeah. non-verbal so there's no really is just the portrayal of what happens there and what whatever meaning it is that it invokes for you other than that i would also recommend any werner herzog documentary oh, yeah. really but I think between the ones we've discussed, I prefer uh, Lessons of Darkness. I think that's one that's still, even now, like it's, I think it's from the 80s, but it's still visually stunning. And I think that's one that really shows the power of how can you kind of destroy the barrier between fiction and fact and between truth and reality, because it feels real, but, or it is real, but at the same time, it feels like this mythological story and the way he plays with both of those elements is just, I find it really yeah, fascinating. I agree with that. Lessons of Darkness is one of my favorite m movies of all time. There's just like images mm -hmm. from that that I think will permanently be <laughs> seared into my brain that I think about and that I've never, like, you know, have never seen anywhere else. It's a little bit unlike some of the other ones that it's pretty unconventional, but I think it's a little less challenging to watch in that, like, there's kind of like when you're watching them deal with the oil situation, there's like some very interesting stuff happening and you're kind of like, how are they going to do this? And, you know, it shows their process. And mm -hmm. so it's a little bit more accessible than just like, you're going to look at trees for two hours or, you know, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that one's a little, a little bit more. Uh, if you're fine delving into the existential underbelly of humanity and, you know images of <laughs> <laughs> our darker nature, then that's a good place to start. And then hopefully also, you know, uh, check out whatever you find interesting, because I, I do find like the more of these kind of movies you watch, the more yes. you start to yeah. appreciate them. And the more you get used to kind of knowing, like obviously all these movies are very different from each other, but you, once you know what to expect, it also becomes easier to become or to let yourself be immersed in yeah. it. Well, and so, yeah, that's a final recommendation on, from yeah. my end. It's very fun when I did my video on this. I got a lot of great recommendations for stuff from people in the comments, mm -hmm. and some of which I watched. That's where I got, I heard about Gunda and James Benning, and mm -hmm. then Vittorio De Sita, which I didn't talk about, but he was an Italian documentarian who made short documentaries that you can find them on Criterion. Obviously, we're, we've talked about the genre, but we've left a lot out. So let us know on social media or whatever what your what your favorites are from the kind of unconventional experimental. We're always looking for uh, good yes. recommendations. Well, thank you all for listening. If you enjoy the show, be sure to check us out on our creator-owned streaming service, Nebula, where you can experience our podcast ad-free, listen to all of our episodes a week early, and get access to monthly bonus episodes that aren't available anywhere else. On Nebula, we for example covered the latest Doctor Strange movie and discussed Stanley Kubrick's classic 2001 A Space Odyssey. Right now, the best way to get access to Nebula is by signing up for CuriosityStream, which comes with a free Nebula subscription. To learn more, visit curiositystream.com slash cinemaofmeaning. 